Hello everyone, my name is Afshin Degan and I'm presenting my CVPR paper Target Identity Aware Network Flow for Online Multiple Target Tracking. This is a joint work with H1 Tian, Dr. Philip Tor, and Dr. Mubarak Shah. Most previous multiple object tracking method, they divide the problem into two separate problems. First, a pre-trained object detector is used to, to get the object hypothesis in every frame of a sequence, as you can see in bottom left. And later, the object detection are linked together, uh, the object detection that belong to the same person are linked together to, to form the tracks and assign one ID to that. This process is called data association. So the problem of these methods is that if object detector fail, most probably the tracker would also fail. For example, consider scenarios like this, that targets are going under heavy articulation and heavy pose changes. So uh, very likely uh, pre-trained object detector would fail because it hasn't been trained on such scenarios. You can also see another example, a running sequence, where we have four person running in the scene and we are reducing the threshold of an object detector, but still we are not getting very good detection. We are just increasing the number of false positive. And at the bottom you see the results of a, uh, of a tracking method. And as you can see, failure in detection would cause very poor uh, performance of, of the tracker as well. So considering detection and data association is two major components of, of, uh, of multiple object tracking method, in this work we are bringing them into a single pipeline and we are trying to solve them simultaneously and we are not looking at them as two separate problems. And thus we are proposing a tracker that not only works well for sequences that a pre-trained object detector will work well, but also it works for sequences that a pre-trained object detector will fail, like the one that I showed you in the beginning. If you look back into the literature, structural learning has been a very powerful and popular method for detection and localization. It also has been used uh, in the context of single object tracking and in uh, one of our recent surveys, uh, which is published in IEEE PAMI, we showed that this tracker is actually a state-of-the-art tracker compared to other 18 trackers that we use uh, in our study. But the extension of this tracker to multiple object tracking has been um, relatively unexplored. On the other hand, network flow is a very powerful and popular choice for, for data association. Uh, it's been used, of course, to solve the multiple object tracking problem. And one of the reasons that it's very popular is because it has a very fast inference. Considering structural learning as the component that takes care of the detection and network flow as the component that takes care of the tracking, we would like to bring them into the same pipeline uh, to solve the MOTA problem. Here is the pipeline. Uh, given positive sample for every target in few frames, for example, here we have three targets, and for each of them we have uh, four uh, positive samples. We use structural learning to train a model for each of these targets and get the model parameters for each target, W1, W2, and W3. The inference is used to find the most violated constraint that is used during structural learning. And for finding the most violated constraint, we propose a new network flow graph that we'll talk about it later. Once the model parameters for each target is learned, uh, given a test sequence and dense overlapping candidate windows sample all over the frame for this test sequence, uh, we use the same inference function, we use the model parameters that we got from structural learning, and we do data association to get the tracks. Once we get the tracks, uh, we use a passive-aggressive algorithm to update the model if necessary. These two components are the components that take care of the detection in our pipeline, and these uh, three components are the components that take care of the tracking in our pipeline. Let's have a look at the structural learning in our framework. This is one of the major components of our tracker, which, where the goal is to learn a prediction function that predicts the location of targets in, in a set of frame. If we have one target, one frame, this is going to be the score function that we have, where W is the model parameters and phi is the joint feature map. In our case, we have multiple objects and multiple frames, thus we have double summation, one over the number of frame and one over the k objects that we have in the scene. In order to find the parameter W, we need to find the following optimization problem, uh, where Y bar is all the dense candidate windows used during training, and Y is the positive sample, and the loss function is defined uh, as, as follow, and this intersection shows the overlap between the two bounded boxes. For an inference function, given a fixed W parameters, we would like to find, uh, we would like to solve the following optimization problem that we showed also before. This uh, inference is used to find the most violated constraint during learning, 
uh, of structural learning where we are learning the parameters for each target. We have to find the most valid constraint to be able to solve the optimization problem efficiently, shown in previous slide. Thus, we use our inference function to find the most valid constraint. And also, we use the same inference function to find the tracks during testing with learning is done completely. We propose to formulate inference as a data association problem because we use this to find tracks. So we want to make sure the tracks are meaningful. Thus, formulating as that as data association will ensure that we can put some physical constraint to, to get meaningful tracks. And we can also reduce the search space because we can enforce some temporal consistency between the bounding boxes uh, to, to solve this more efficiently. Uh, as we talked about it before, network flow is our, is our choice. Why? Because it's fast and it has an exact solution. Having an exact solution for an optimization would open the door for powerful structural learning method, which, which, which we are dealing with here. Let's have a look at traditional network flow. This is the objective function I'm showing on bottom right. And here is the network for three frames where we have three detection in every frame. For every detection, we consider a pair of nodes. Uh, the pair of nodes are connected through observation edges. And the cost of this observation edge is usually, is usually coming from uh, uh, pre-trained object detection confidence, confidence scores. The detection in consecutive frames are connected using transition edges that capture the similarity between the nodes, and we have source and sync nodes. But the problem with this network flow is that we cannot directly use it as our inference function. Why? Because first of all, it, there's no notion of the parameter w in our inference function here, in our objective function. We spend a lot of time to learn those parameters, and we want to take advantage of those parameters. We want to use them during inference. But if we can't, then it's useless to use this network. And the other thing is that you can see that the objective function is different from the score function we've shown before. In order to, to, to do the inference, we propose a new network flow graph, which is a variety of multi-commodity flow graph and has major differences with network flow. First of all, there's multiple source and multiple sinks in this graph, one source and one sink for, one sink for every target. The other major difference is that instead of having only one observation edge per node, we have now k observation edge per, um, for every pair of node, basically for every detection candidate window in every frame. But every observation edge encodes the probability of assigning the, that ID to that detection candidate. This is where we are using the information coming from structural learning. We got the parameter w, and here we use it to get the edge cost belonging to this observation edge. And transition edges also encode both appearance and motion information in our case. How do we solve this graph? The goal here is to find k flows by pushing one unit of flow through each source node. f is the variable that we assign to every flow, and cij is the cost associated to that flow. In case of single, in case of traditional network flow, this is going to be the objective function. But here we have multi-commodity, so this is the objective function that we are dealing with here. And you can see that's very similar to the inference function that we, we would like to solve eventually. In order to make sure that the tracks are feasible tracks in real world, we have to ensure three constraints. First is the supply-demand constraint, where it's saying that the sum of Incoming flows to a node should be equal to the sum of outgoing flows from a node. Flow should be a binary variable. And also the last constraint is saying that among all the observation edges for a pair of nodes, at most one of them needs to be selected. These set of constraints are called bundle constraints. Now let's see how do we solve this. Uh, TINF can be formulated using integer programming. But you need to remember that we are solving uh, here instead of having sparse candidate windows coming from a pre-trained object detector, we are dealing with, with, with dense candidate window sample all over the frame. So instead of dealing with tens of detection per frame, we are dealing with thousands of detection per frame. So our graph is huge in terms of number of nodes and edges. Our experiments show that without pruning steps, integer programming is not feasible and is inefficient. So instead, we propose a Lagrange relaxation solution, which is very fast. Uh, we relax the inequality constraint. The reason we do that is that when we relax the inequality constraint or the bundle constraint, the problem decomposes to separate minimum cost flow for, for each target. This is where the magic happens. This is, this is why the Lagrange relaxation is super fast, because now we can use dynamic programming to solve the minimum cost flow for each target. 
Once we relax and we get the objective function shown in previous slide, the core of our optimization is split into two main steps. We solve the minimum cost flow for each identity using given a fixed Lagrange multiplier and using this cost coefficient. Once we find the tracks for each target, we update the Lagrange multiplier uh, given the equation here. You can see an example on the right. We want to find the track for three person. We solve the minimum cost flow for person one. We find the red track. For person two, we find the green track. And person three, we find the purple one. Uh, and, and through iteration, as you can see, uh, these two tracks are sharing detections. So Lagrange multiplier, by considering the flow overlap, would take care of these shared detection. And after a few iterations, we get the tracks that we actually want. We also implemented the uh, integer programming and linear programming version of TINF. Um, and we compared the runtime for different number of targets. This is the curve you get for IP. This is the curve you get for LP, and this is the curve for, you get for a uh, Lagrange relaxation solution. As you can see, we can get up to two order of magnitude speed up compared to other two techniques. Let's have a look at some qualitative results. This is the running sequence we showed in the beginning. We compare our method with two uh, other tracking by detection methods, like track and spot, and as you can see, we do better. Spot and force uh, the targets to keep the structure throughout the sequence. We can see this is obviously not a good constraint in all the scenarios. And for example, as you can see, targets not always are keeping the structure throughout the sequence. Even in this one, that uh, it, it appears better compared to the other one, still we can do much, much better compared to two other methods. The last thing we need to talk about is the overlap constraint. Consider sequences like this with, where people with similar appearance are walking next to each other. Um, as we uh, explained before, Lagrange relaxation would take care of uh, shared detection, but what if bounding works are highly overlapping? If you are having a pre-trained object detector getting object hypothesis, this has been taken care of using non-maximum suppression during detection. But here we don't have a step like that to, to take care of these tracks and get more meaningful tracks. Can you see another example of such, such failure cases? These are not actually failure cases, but the tracks are not uh, very, very satisfying, very plausible. So we want to kind of fix those tracks by using our overlap constraint. Now we're going to show how we do this. Consider a person in the scene, and the white circles are the dense candidate window sample for this person, for example, in this frame. Uh, this is for the next frame, next frame, and overall, these are the union of candidate windows for that person in a batch of frame. If you have another person, we take all the candidate windows, we put them together to create the graph, our TINF graph. Given these two person, we run our optimization. In first iteration, we find these two tracks for these people by solving the minimum cost flow individually for each of them. As you can see, the red track and the yellow track are overlapping in three frames that we are showing in purple. So the Lagrange multiplier will take care of this overlapping detection, overlapping nodes, uh, this, this, this shared nodes. And after a few iterations, let's say in iteration three, we get a better tracks that there is not any shared nodes in the tra tracks. Thus, the optimization would stop. But again, you see that the tracks are not very good because they are overlapping still, even though they are not sharing any nodes. But since the nodes are sampled densely in the frames, the tracks may not be very nice when you look at them. So we want to kind of take care of that. Thus, we introduce our overlap constraint to discourage the targets to take paths which highly overlap. Uh, this also replaced the non-maximum suppression step, and we use this multiplier that penalizes the cost of the nodes that highly overlap. And after a few more iterations, this is the final results that we get. That is the result that we want. Now you can have a look at uh, some some results. Um, on the top, you see where we are not using um, overlap constraint. On the bottom, you see where we are using overlap constraint. Again, you can see we can get better tracks, and for the other. A person, you can see again, we do, we do much better when we don't use the overlap constraint. Here's the algorithm. Uh, the input to our uh, algorithm is dense Canada window sample across the frame in T frames. And we get the parameters W that we learn through structural learning. We build a graph. 
we solve the minimum, we, in every iteration we do three things. We solve the minimum cost flow for each identity separately using dynamic programming. We update the Lagrange multiplier and we also update the spatial constraint multiplier. And giving these two, we update the edge cost if necessary and we do this until convergence. For quantitative evaluation, we use clear metrics, MOT A and MOT E, and we use trajectory-based measure, MTML, mostly track, mostly loss, and ID switches. On the right, you see the results of our method on the sequences that pre-trained object detector work well, parking lot two, parking lot one, TUD crossing, and PET 2009. Um, the, 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 this column, the third column, uh, fifth column, and the last column is the columns that we have to look at because this is the MOTA, this is mostly track, and the last column is ID switch. And as you can see, we can do better compared to other methods in those metrics. Uh, and f for running and dancing sequence where pre-trained object detector fail, uh, we also compare our method with struck and spot, uh, which, which do detection inside the framework and they don't use pre-trained object detector and we show that still we can do much better. If you look at mod A, mostly track and ID switch, we can do much better. Uh, we don't really keep P because it really depends on the underlying human detector that you use. So depending on what human detector you use or what kind of detection method you use, you can get a tighter bounding boxes that would increase the MOTP. Um, the other constraint, uh, the other experiment with it was to consider the, uh, to, to see the effect of overlap constraint. As you can see, when we use overlap constraint, we can improve MOTA, MO, uh, mostly track, and also ID switches. And it improves significantly, for example, for PL parking lot 2 and TUD sequence, or like 6 7% improvement uh, by just using the special um, overlap constraint. The last experiment we did was that instead of manually annotating the target in first view frame, we use an object detector to annotate the targets. We can get comparable performance, uh, and the drop in performance is mostly because some of the tracks start late, because we have to wait until we get confident detection for a target to initialize the track. And this is being done if we get in, in five consecutive frames, if we get detection for a person that overlap more than 50%, we'll initialize the track for that. You can see some more qualitative results. This is the PET sequence. Uh, we can do fairly well on this sequence. These are the results where we manually annotated the targets. We get fewer number of ID switches, but still there's a couple of ID switches. I think it's three or four ID switches. And these are the results on TUD sequence. Again, it's a very short sequence, but uh, Mm. Let me play this. It's a very short sequence, but we show that we can do very good compared to other methods on this sequence as well. There's a lot of, there's a low camera angle, a lot of occlusion happening in this. And finally, I want to show you how our uh, most violent constraints are found. I'm going to show you an example of that as well. You see a track of one person. And the bottom left, you see dense candidate windows. And here we show the most violent constraint that are found whenever we are updating the target. So it's not found in every segment, but whenever passive aggressive is used to update it, we have to find the most violent constraint that we show it here. And that it's mostly a person very similar to a person that we are tracking that is not highly overlapping with that. In summary, we propose a method that combines discriminative learning with data association. We propose a new graph. Uh, which is a variety of multi-commodity -com graph, and we propose an efficient solution for that. Uh, we propose a new overlap constraint that replaces non-greeting on maximum suppression.